skill set that uh, CPAs possess, where they analyze, evaluate, and investigate uh, data so they can present evidential matter either in a courtroom, a boardroom, a deposition, or other venue where there's a trier of fact. Now, Gary, I've used forensic accountants in many, many cases. So what are some of the types of cases that a forensic accountant becomes important to use? Uh, it could be, be in a matrimonial matter, uh, which we've worked on numerous times together. Uh, it could be in a shareholder dispute, a partnership dispute. Uh, it could be in, a, uh, in an evaluation matter. Uh, I have a number of designations. I'm, I'm a CPA. I'm a certified fraud examiner, certified in financial forensics. I'm a certified valuation analyst. And when I do my investigation, I use each one of those skills to understand and look at the transaction that I'm involved in six different ways from Sunday. Uh, because oftentimes when you look at something from your right eye versus your left eye, and I mean that if you close it and you look at it this way versus this way, you might it might look differently. Uh, and that's an important aspect because nothing is ever as it appears, especially when you're doing forensic investigations. Now, you and I have worked together, and I know that you are one of the most skilled forensics out there. Um, can you Thank tell you. me in terms of in the divorce world, because that's why, why I think people are here tonight, what are the types of work that you do specifically in, in the world of divorce? Sure. So in, in the world of divorce, we do everything from valuations of closely held businesses we do the preparation of uh, something we're going to be talking about this evening uh, known as a net worth statement. Uh, we do investigation for um, hidden assets. We will do a lifestyle analysis uh, to determine to see what the lifestyle that the marital estate or the couple are leading uh, as compared to what the revenue source is. Um, and I'm going to tell you, and I was going to save it for later, but uh, it might be a good segue into the net worth statement, is things that are not on the net worth statement are almost as important, if not more important, than things that are on the net worth statement. Because oftentimes people are willing to put something on the net worth statement because they're saying, oh, I'm, I'm an open book. Here it is. Everything I have is there. And... What's not there, as I said, is probably more important than what is there. So, Karen, so we brought up the net worth statement. Tell us what a net worth statement is. So good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. So happy to be here And the net worth statement. And I know that we probably have a nationwide audience. So um, it is that statement, regardless of what it's labeled. Uh, it's sometimes labeled income and expense, asset and debt, net worth. All of those statements mean the same thing. And here's what you need to know about them. Those statements are extremely important. And in my work as a CDFA, I am laser focused on how my clients are actually filling out these forms and the information that they're putting in there. What's in the net worth statement? Well, the net worth statements talks about a lot of what you have asset wise. And the forms divide that up somewhat differently, but they get at your accounts that you have, the financial accounts that you have all of them, investment accounts that you have, um, stock accounts. Uh, they should be dealing with any real estate properties that, that you have and, and coming through uh, all of those. So in, in essence, any assets that you're holding in the marital estate are supposed to be reflected in that net worth statement. Now, um, I'm from the West Coast. Uh, I'm coming to you from the San Francisco Bay Area this afternoon and evening. And so we do an income and expense declaration that's a part of our whole net worth situation. And so in that respect, we're looking at all forms of income that you are making. So whether that's W-2, 1099, K-2, or self-employed, K-1, excuse me, not K-2, K-1, self-employed, it really doesn't matter. We're looking for all the income that's coming in for each person. We're also looking at the expenses. This is something where a lot of people struggle a little bit because uh, they're not sure whether there's expenses today, expenses after the divorce, you know, how are we looking at expenses? So I'm making sure that we're looking at the picture as accurately as possible. Why? Um, because as Lisa knows, Gary knows, and Don knows, um, these statements are oftentimes reviewed by the judge. And they're going to take those statements pretty much at face value. And if they're not fi filled out in a way that, that um, manifests correctly, what is going on in all those areas that you heard me describe, that could be problematic a little bit later. So it is a very tedious task. 
one that does involve the acquisition of a lot of information on the part of the potential client. Um, and that is where I do a lot of work in that respect. I'm making sure that all the correct documents are gathered as a certified divorce financial analyst and that I'm walking alongside this process and making sure it's done. So those are some of the key elements, Lisa, of the net worth uh, statement. So John, mm. um, I know that you actually had the experience as a, as a client of filling out the net worth statement. And frankly, I, I also know that it is one of the most tedious um, and difficult things um, about going through a divorce. So can you tell us how you went about it and what you did and how it felt and how you got past it? Because it is it is a thing for sure. It, it definitely is a thing. Um, I wouldn't say tedious. I would say like soul shattering. <laughs> I mean, for me, when, when Karen was talking about how, you know, it's a struggle, uh, I just had no idea about how much it costs to live. I didn't, I didn't, you know, it was almost for me, like the bigger the number, the less reality it had. Um, so that was true on one hand. So the whole idea of like assets and liabilities, I'd never done that. Um, and the assets were smaller and the liabilities were greater. Um, my stuff wasn't worth as much as I thought it was. That was depressing. So you know, when I filled out the whole top part with the big numbers, the, that was, you know, one sort of reality check. But the expense number, you know, I'd never thought about um, myself as like a small business, you know, like a, the sort of burn rate idea. Um, and so finding out how much it actually costs to live, I remember saying like, well, you know, four weeks is a month. And Lisa goes, no, 4.3 weeks is a month. Like, I didn't even have an idea that that's how you figured out your like weekly to monthly expenses. And then figuring out it was, there was a before and after sort of idea too to the net worth statement in terms of the expenses. How much did it cost to live in the old lifestyle pre-divorce and how much was it going to cost me to live post, you know, my child and I after. Um, and uh, even now, I mean, I've, I've said this before, I still have that net worth statement seared in my brain. I know exactly every day how much it costs me to live. And a, like a buzzer goes off in my mind if I go above like a certain amount. Uh, you know, I'm the person who scours their credit card statements for when like, uh, oh, you know, you, you are subscribing to PBS and Acorn this month. No, no, no. You know, I like, I like, I'm so careful. I'm so careful. And so it was a slap in the face, but it was so, it was such a good thing to do. It was a really, really hard thing to do, but it was, it was life changing. I mean, we're talking about 10 years ago now. Like, I'm talking like it was yesterday. It feels like it was yesterday. So Gary, when we go through um, when we go through this these valuations, and um, and maybe one of the things I, I'd like you to explain because it actually does relate to the net worth statement that John and Karen were just talking about, which is this idea of a lifestyle analysis. So you and I have done many lifestyle analysis. Um, one of the reasons that we do them is that people need support sometimes during the divorce, interim support. And then they need support after the divorce. And it's it's valuable to figure out in terms of what is somebody's income, et cetera. So can you tell us what a lifestyle analysis is, why it's why we do it um at all and and how you do it? What you what what you do? Sure. So so lifestyle analysis essentially is where you look at the lifestyle that the individuals are living. And what you essentially do, as Dawn said a moment ago, is you write down or take into consideration all of the disbursements that the individual is making on a monthly basis, weekly basis, daily basis. Um, and, I, and I do it in that order because usually I work from macro and I drill down into the micro. Uh, because if you do it the other way, you really typically don't capture everything. So what you do is you look at the big ticket items first. You look at your rent, you look at your mortgage, you look at your real estate taxes, you look at your utilities, your gas, your electric, your water, you look at your insurance, you look at your gardener, you look at your car expenses. And when you look at your car expenses, it's not only the car itself, your lease payment, if you have it, it's the repairs, it's the um, insurance, 
it's the gas that goes into it and it's the other attributes and what you do is you come up with this this value of how much you're spending and oftentimes and i have this more times than not the value that most individuals are spending far exceeds the amount of revenue that is coming in so that's telling me two things either they're funding their lifestyle through debt or the spouse or the other individual is not sharing with them all the income that they're earning and that's why one of the things I was going to say earlier, and I don't recall if I said it or not, but the, the, the net worth statement, which is basically all the assets that you have, those are good things, minus all the liabilities, gives you your net worth. But that net worth statement is a living, breathing item, and it changes. The net worth statement that you do on the beginning of the month might not be the same as the net worth statement that you do at the end of the month. And that's because there are so many different attributes associated with it and the value of those attributes are changing at the speed of light. You know, we have things today that people are investing in. Lisa and I were involved in a case several years ago where the gentleman called himself the king of crypto. And what he did is instead of taking his salary or compensation, he got cryptocurrency. I'm not going to use the word Bitcoin because that's like Xerox. A copier could be a Roche, could be a Xerox, could be anything, Canon, etc. But he he had crypto, if I remember correctly, in 15 to 20 different entities that he received these assets rather than compensation. He did not get W-2s. He did not get K-1s, as Karen said a moment ago. He didn't even get the K-2s that Karen mentioned a moment ago. <laughs> I'm teasing you, Karen. But he, there was no, there was really nowhere that we can go to find these assets until we subpoenaed the company's records that were distributing these assets. So I know, I know it's a long-winded question, but what I'm saying to you is take a real good, hard look at the lifestyle that you're living and see if the assets or revenue stream that you're getting into your life warrants the life that you're living. Lisa, so, if, I, if I may. Um, absolutely. Very quickly, uh, when uh, Gary was bringing up the cryptocurrency example, one of the things to think about too, and I think about it from a divorce finance analyst perspective, I have a case in which serious losses were incurred by one of the partners because of the trading in that, right? So now we're looking at how we're going to apportion that as we move towards suggestions for the marital settlement. What are we going to do about that? Because she's not going to be able to get that money back. So to all of the points here raised, I just wanted to raise that, you know, just being aware of all funds, everything that's going on and what's going on with some of these fungible things is very important. Uh, excuse me, Lisa, and thank you. No, I, I'm I'm happy you raised that. And and I'm also going to say, Gary, my experience as an attorney is I always look at the um, net worth statement and I look at the expenses. And sometimes somebody is saying, to your point, that their income is very low, but their expenses are very high and there's no debt on the net worth statement. So what does that tell you at that moment? That's like a red flag, isn't it? Absolutely. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. And the, and the net worth statement can really be a roadmap for other things. And what I mean by that is they might not put down all the liabilities that they have. They might not put down all the credit cards that they have that are out there. Um, but it's interesting because I was involved in a case a few years ago where the net worth statement did reveal a loan that the individual had. And what we did is we subpoenaed the bank and got the personal financial statement that the individual yep. submitted to get the loan. How rosy do you think that personal financial statement was compared to the net worth statement that they purported in the divorce? It was, exactly. it was like reading two different, two different books it, with two, indeed, di with, with two of, different endings. Two different endings. And, and one of the things that I get involved in is I make sure that we're pulling credit reports and the um, a tax return is a treasure trove for me. Uh, of looking at things that maybe aren't divulged uh, and things that uh, people didn't know. It's, it's, quite, it's quite the investigation. Absolutely. So, 
Karen, talk to us about that, because um, one of the things that as attorneys we do and we really advocate for is the discovery process yeah. in conjunction with somebody like Gary being on the case as part of our team. And even, you know, without. OK, we we do quite a bit of discovery. What is discovery? Can you explain what that is, Karen? Yes, I can. Um, discovery is the way that. Um, family law professionals and sometimes on the civil side as well, but it's, it's, it's the, um, the gathering process. And that gathering process can take a little, a few different iterations. It can be done in a question and answer uh, scenario uh, with your counsel together with a court reporter. That's called a deposition. Uh, it can be done in writing, wherein questions are developed and sent over to the other side. And maybe uh, you could be the recipient of them from the other side as well. There's an exchange of this information, but questions are put together in an, in an attempt to uh, define and discover uh, relevant information and data that's important uh, in moving the case forward. So that's done in writing. Another uh, form is when we are um, requesting documents. Uh, there's no call request for documents. It's usually named something similar. But those go out uh, to the party sometimes back and forth as well. When I was mentioning tax returns, I was mentioning uh, credit reports, when Gary was mentioning uh, some of the documents that he's looking at, these are some of the things that are requested and investigated in these matters in order to pull more information out, right? And you can also uh, request to have an evaluation done on someone as well. Uh, to find out a vocational evaluation. Um, if one of the parties is underemployed or not employed during the course of the relationship, we want to find out, is there an ability to them to be employed? And if so, at what level? And so uh, those are other, another discovery tool that can happen in order to sort of stabilize that conversation. So those are some of the ways uh, that people can think about uh, the discovery process, Lisa. And Dawn, you had the great pleasure or not so much, of going through the discovery process. Um, you you actually sat through depositions. Um, you gathered documents. Tell us about that experience as a client, because I think that um, a lot of people feel so overwhelmed by the discovery process. And when they first come to me as an attorney, um, or even in the middle of their case, or somewhere along the line, they say, do we really have to do this discovery? Is it important to do? Um, why are you doing it? Tell us, you know, how you got through it, because it, it is such an important piece of, of, of going through the divorce process. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think Maybe it, you know, my divorce went on for like four and a half years. And I think a lot of the time that it took, you know, was partly this sort of back and forth. Um, we, we did hire a forensic accountant to look for hidden assets, which unfortunately we didn't find. But I mean, that revealed a whole host of other things. I mean, we needed to know that they weren't there because as you said, that there were discrepancies, you know, in, in I not only did I, you know, fill out a net worth statement, but so did my you know, now ex-spouse. Um, and uh, I do remember I, I spent uh, many, like hundreds of hours myself uh, going through credit card statements. And we did eventually prove uh, wasteful dissipation. And, you know, that was worth doing. But I, as you want to know, tedious, the net worth statement was nothing compared to, you know, I had kept a, a in my in my little calendar, you know, back in the days of paper calendars, where I was and where my ex-husband was every day. I don't know why I did this. Maybe I was like subconsciously taking notes for years and then comparing those to multiple credit card statements, his work credit card statements and his uh, personal and mine, and then was able to document years of wasteful dissipation. So um, that was mostly, I think the discovery was also getting the bank accounts you know, it was, it took a long time to get documents. I, I don't know why. It does. It, it, it does. And, time. and the deposition part of it. So uh, you sat in the room with me, we, we did these depositions. Um, maybe, you know, I think people get a little bit unnerved by the concept of them. Tell, tell us how you got through that process. I got through, I mean, I'll, you know, I've already 
let slip that you were my lawyer. I got through it because I had a strong attorney who I trusted because, you know, it is, it, it, it is a little nerve wracking, frankly, going to court. It's not nerve wracking. Everyone gets worried about court. Don't get worried about court, but the deposition you have to be prepared for. And, you know, because the person, they're, they're right there on the other side of the table. And, you know, I think we all have our own story that we tell ourselves and your ex soon to be ex spouse has their own story. And sometimes you are faced with, you know, you were talking about um, Karen, you know, proving whether the underemployed or unemployed, you know, a spouse can work. And I remember that was very painful for me because I was the under or unemployed spouse at the time. And I remember, you know, this long portion of the deposition being about, you know, why don't you have a job? Why, you know, I mean, like that was, that was painful to hear. Uh, true, by the way, uh, even more painful. So, you know, there are things that come up during a divorce that go exactly counter to the stories that we tell ourselves during, during a marriage, which is partially why the marriage unravels, right? That's some true. of it is financial, some of it is not. Um, and I think the deposition is one of the places because it's so detailed where some of that stuff does come out. And that's why the, the team concept is very important. Um, as Lisa was saying earlier and Gary was relating, right? Um, as experts, I've been an expert witness at trial on issues of marital standard of living, um, on retirement assets, and the team that Lisa brings together on behalf of her clients is very important, right? That's why our work is so detailed. That's why there's so much put into what we're doing because I had to sit through a deposition. I had to be approved by the judge to be the expert on that subject. And so knowing that that background work has been done well on behalf of the client is something that gives the client a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, peace or, or more peace. And, and certainly gives professionals uh, like Lisa a whole lot of peace um, as she's putting together the case. So, yeah. Gary, what is wasteful dissipation? Can you um, explain that? Yes. Because I think that um, some people may not know that terminology. Sure. It's essentially where the, the, the one spouse uh, takes money out of the marital estate uh, without the permission or the knowledge of the other spouse. Um, and, you know, I testified to this in court in New Jersey. Uh, and the judge was all set to rule and the other side settled at the last minute, but here was an interesting thing. This particular individual was a, uh, the husband, I was representing the wife, husband was a day trader. And over a two and a half year period, this husband, unbeknownst to the wife, had racked up, because he was such a good day trader, had racked up $700,000 of losses, of capital losses. And this, they basically, he basically dissipated the marital estate by that amount. And I got the judge to agree that the lost carry forwards was a asset of the marital estate that the wife was entitled to. Uh, and we were all set to make case law in New Jersey. I was on the witness stand for two days. Um, and as the case was unwinding, the other side saw the writing on the wall. The other interesting thing was, was that this individual was a real, I'm sorry, was it a, a, um, an insurance broker for health and life insurance. And he said that his book was not saleable. When, when he retired, the, the, the book retired with him. And I did investigation with, and saw where other people representing the same company were able to sell. And the company even had a program set up that they could sell. He was a Schedule C, uh, but they were able to sell that book of business and generate assets to the person retiring. So once I testified to that, all of a sudden I saw him lean over and whisper to the attorney uh, that was representing him. Uh, the judge said, I, I, I'll give a recess and they ended up settling the case. So uh, ultimately yeah, my, what I testified to did not become case law because it was never ruled on, but uh, you know, it stuck in my craw that we were able to do that for that, uh, that spouse. Uh, get her the loss carry forwards because we negotiated at the end and we did get her a value in his business. I believe it came out to something like $1.9 million. Uh, so where he, where he represented that there was no value whatsoever. So I'm going to answer one question. So a wasteful dissipation um, can also be things like gambling. Absolutely. Um, Day Drug trading use. is gambling. <laughs> right. It is. That's true. Um, that, that's true. Gambling, <laughs> drug use, 
um, extra money spent on extramarital affairs. Very often we we find, and this was what Dawn was talking about earlier, um, in terms of going through credit cards, it may not have been specific to Dawn, but um, going through credit cards and actually seeing that there are maybe um, hotels, airplane tickets for people, all of these different um, items may be on credit cards. And we then have somebody like Gary or someone like Karen um, come back in and add this all up, figure it all out, um, go and then put it back into the marital pot, so to speak, and then ask for the other spouses, the one who is not wastefully dissipating the assets, for their fair share of the of these assets that have been wastefully dissipated. Um, so that that's what that's about. Now, there's a lot of ways you could do these things too, Lisa. For example, you know, you know, people always look at the caches in the computer in the search engines where the people have been looking at. In fact, there was the gentleman who recently was charged. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but he was looking for certain ways to do things with uh, in, in in the murder that he allegedly committed. I say allegedly because you know innocent to proven guilty. But you can go into um, the individual's car and look at the navigation system, and you can see where they've been going. You can look at the odometer. And if you know that the person goes to and from work, but you all of a sudden that they're 50 miles more on the odometer uh, than there should have been, uh, you can cross check that to the navigation system. Most people do not erase that navigation system. They don't even realize that it's stored in the uh, in the car. Uh, a lot of people are using um, Waze now too. If you can get to the spouse's phone, you can go into the Waze program uh, or City Mapper is another one that's used in Manhattan. Those of you living in New York City or other cities across the country. But these all have caches that you can go back and look and see the locations that these individuals are going to. Now, Gary, we talked, you talked earlier about doing valuations of businesses and many of um, my clients have businesses. Um, tell me what kind of businesses you have valued um, in the past in terms of divorce actions. I, I valued everything from uh, funeral homes to um, legal practices to uh, moving and storage companies. Uh, we're involved right now with uh, you, Lisa, in, val in valuing a number of real estate entities. Now, real estate entities are interesting because those are what I call collapsible type organizations or companies, and they're built for a specific purpose. Uh, and once that purpose is done, uh, that, that entity either collapses into another organization or uh, it starts to generate losses. Uh, just because a company is generating losses does not mean it has no value. One of the biggest companies in the world, Amazon, is generating losses. It's also generating free cash flow as we as we uh, are sitting here tonight. So you've got to really look at the attributes of the company. And there's different ways that you can value a company. You can either value a company based upon the historical earnings of the company or you can base it upon the projected cash flow of the company. I was involved with the, with the individual who was going through a divorce one time who was a um, owned a security company, a bouncer. Uh, and he, he, had, he, he had all these high-end clubs. Well, what happened is that at that particular time, there were um, a lot of um, um, issues going on with the clubs and there were a couple fires. So the revenue stream was down for the clubs. Well, I didn't. I didn't do the valuation on the on the um, histor on the uh, projected earnings of the company because they were. It was on a downward spiral. I did it based upon historical earnings and the lifestyle that they lived. So you see, in tandem, we're coming full circle. You look at the lifestyle that they're living, and if the company's value does not support the lifestyle that they're living, there's got to be a cash a cash attribute associated with that valuation. Um, and there's a number of ways, you know, even though people have gas stations, pizza parlors, other bars, other cash businesses, there are other ways to come up with the value. I have a formula, that proprietary formula that I use when I value restaurants, that I, that I look in to the table turns. I look at the menu. I look at how often somebody gets up from the table. I look at the average price of the table. And it could probably tell you pretty darn close as to how much revenue that they're making. And then we cross check it with some of the supplies that the uh, that they buy in the business. So, you know, there are different ways to pull that string 
in order to determine the value of the company. So when you actually, I'm going to go back to this discovery um, process. So what are the steps when you're valuing a company or doing a lifestyle analysis? Um, what are the steps in terms of what types of documents do you start to look for? What are you going to ask for, Gary? Um, I'm going to ask for, well, there's two things. I'm going to ask for the bank statements of the couple because I want to know what's coming into the, to, to the marital estate. And I'm also going to, to sit down and take an inventory, as I said before, of all the expenditures that are going out, um, not, only, um, not only through checks, but on, on a cash basis. I want to know the lifestyle that they're living. You know, people that, uh, you know, I'm involved in a case right now where the individual allegedly is only making $50,000 a year, yet they're donating $70,000 a year to their, uh, their religious affiliation. So somehow, some way, they're getting money into that marital estate. And I'm just, I've just signed the engagement letter, but this is the first thing that the wife had mentioned to me uh, when they hired me. Uh, so I'm going to be taking a deep dive there. Um, so, you know, you want to look at both. There's two sides of transactions. There's the income side and the expense side. And what you've got to do is you've got to look at both and you've got to reconcile them. As I said, the money's got to be coming in through either cash sources or debt. And the important thing to know about the debt side is that you as the spouse might be obligated on that debt, depending upon how the other spouse has taken that debt out. So for example, if you have a house and there's a home equity loan or something along those lines, where you were not aware of that the spouse had taken out because somehow their signature looks very similar to your signature. Um, notwithstanding that, you're going to be obligated on that uh, on that home equity loan or that HELOC, uh, and you're going to have an obligation to pay it back uh, out of the marital estate. So someone has asked actually what to do, um, and I think it's an interesting question, what to do when someone's actually spent down the assets in the interim of the um, the action. So the assets are being spent down. There's um, probably a summons for divorce um, and there's automatic orders, but still people can spend down. And um, I'm gonna say that it may be time to make a motion to the court to get relief from the court or to have a judge decide how much should be spent um, on a monthly basis by each person. So that, that is, is the way to, to deal with that, perhaps. Now, Dawn, um, what what does a motion mean and what is entailed? Shouldn't you say what a motion means? Well, I can <laughs> say what a motion means from my point of view. So okay. it's where we make an application and we draw up an affidavit and sometimes we draw up case law for the court to review. And sometimes we involve somebody like Karen or Gary, okay, to actually put their um, affidavits in as to what the lifestyle analysis might be, um, et cetera. But the client has to feed us the information about their life, right? Because, you know, everybody's story is different. Everybody's background is different. So tell me what went into um, to doing this, actually, um, Dawn. I, I do remember this sort of motions, like, yeah as being like the nodes of the divorce. Like those were when the sort of main things happened, not so much court appearances because we, we very rarely ended up going to court. And when we did, I mean, it was only in connection with a motion you had made. Most of the time, those just were exchanged, you know, as, as pieces of paper that were just sent over. But I do remember, like, for example, you were talking about an answer to the question in the chat about, you know, it was time to make a motion to the court about how much each party should be spending. You know, for, for me, I, I mean, I remember one of the most important motions was for pendente lite, right? Which was this sort of temporary support that I got in, in the interim before the case was, was finally, you know, decided. And that interim support motion was the most important thing that happened I, during the entire process before the divorce was finalized. Um, and we had to file all sorts of motions. I mean, for example, my uh, now ex-husband changed lawyers, I remember. Um, so there were motions associated with that. There was 
um, attempts from his side to get me to spend money that was in escrow, right? So that was a whole big exchange of motions. There, there were times when he was not paying uh, support for my for my son. So there, there were motions for that. I mean, there. So motions are the sort of ways that the lawyers on the opposing side do battle in the meantime and try to push the the process along. Um, and you know, if you can do that successfully, you can resolve the the case Absolutely. without going to, to to trial, right? I mean, that's that's the way it, that's the way it works. So those are really you know the sort of building blocks as, as I saw it. Don, Don, I wanted to highlight one of the things that you said for the Pendelite support. Um, coming back to the net worth statement um, that I talked about earlier, that determined your temporary alimony. Okay, that yes. was your temporary alimony while the case was going on. Yes. So that's why the preparation of these net worth statements is so key. Okay, that is a consideration during the motion uh, hearing for attorneys like Lisa. It's there. Okay, and that's why you need the care because that is what was determining the money coming into you while the other issues were going. So I just wanted to show what the complete circle of that was right. when you mentioned Pendelite. So and yeah. I'm going to expand actually that Karen a bit because. Um, one of the things that Gary's firm has done for, for many of my clients is this lifestyle analysis that actually um, further enhances the net worth statement. So, um, Gary, why don't you explain um, how that actually works with the net worth statement, the pendente lite motion for both support and for legal fees because and expert fees i mean everybody's you know look I, i'm going to say this that you need lawyers you need experts you need a team of people and sometimes not to hire them right right you can't afford not to hire them that's exactly right mm -hmm. I, that's a hundred percent correct and and in order to have these people sometimes you don't have control of the finances and gary you've done those lifestyle analysis with us to in order for us to be able to get support for our clients so tell us how that all works and why that's so important yeah well essentially when you do the lifestyle analysis you sit down with the spouse you and and you get you determine what the lifestyle that they're accustomed to living and typically what happens is the other side will say well you didn't do that before you didn't do this before you didn't well you know what it's possible that they didn't but you know what this person might be working now a full-time job and they didn't have the luxury they you know they they don't have the luxury of, of being available for the kids when they were there so now they need after school care now they might need some counseling for this for the children that they didn't have before so things change i said before that the net worth statement is a living breathing animal well the lifestyle analysis is also a living breathing item because as your lifestyle changes, so do the expenditures that you need in order to meet your obligations as, as a parent. And that's really Absolutely. what the bottom line is what here. What you I want do. to be is the best parent that you could possibly be Absolutely. based upon the circumstances or hand that you have been dealt. And, one and of I the always say the that... same thing. I said it last time, I'm not going to change it. Knowledge is, knowledge is power. And the more knowledge that you have as to the finances and 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 get a control of what you're doing um, for your children, uh, the more powerful you are as you go through this process. I'm sure, Dawn, that you you saw that when you did it. That's why you wrote down everything that you did, and you <laughs> right. keep good, such good track of the expenditures that you had. And I, I would say on the professional Karen, side, um, Lisa, on the professional side, I'm just going to back up what he's saying. Um, since we have a, a nationwide audience tonight, the issue of alimony and support is handled differently across the nation, right? And so relying on your professionals like Lisa to guide you in what is required and in, in the intensity with which it's required, because a lot of these documents are used differently across the nation, right? In terms of that lifestyle analysis, temporary, permanent support, the support you may get after, uh, after the divorce is final, the judge does it. So that's why all these documents are really key in understanding how they're applying in your particular jurisdiction, your particular case. That's why, as Lisa said, you can't afford to not have the right professionals um, because you need to know how those things are being handled. Uh, Lisa, sorry to have interrupted you. Just want to. No, I'm I'm happy that you did, Karen. And and you know, it, it brings me to back to Dawn actually. So Dawn, 
um, you were out there and and some of our, you know, the people on here may be contemplating divorce, maybe um, in some other stage. But at the very beginning, um, you had to find your team. So how did you go about doing that? Uh, yeah, I mean, just I'll preface that by saying, you know, I think it's very difficult to ask for help. I mean, and I think a lot of times, like for me. I was in an unhappy marriage for a really long time, and that entailed keeping a lot of secrets and pretending that everything was okay. For and I, so I think um, it was uh, you were the first person that I came to, um, and uh, I actually found you uh, online at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, I was I, I couldn't sleep, and I I went on. Uh, you know we've. Now we find everything online 10 years ago, not so much, it's kind of like internet dating. I think it's much more sort of accepted now than it was, but I went on this uh, website called Avo and uh, I, I, I sort of consider myself like a, an educated consumer um, of uh, crowdsourcing. Anyway, uh, I could sort of tell uh, right away that uh, Lisa had these incredible reviews from men, from women, from people who were clearly the wronged party, who were not the wronged party. I And anyway, she just seemed so, so great that I decided finally that I was going to take action with that clarity that you get in the middle of the night. And um, so anyway, I went to, to see her. And uh, I remember that I just told her my story, like kind of briefly. And then I think I just had the wisdom I don't know where it came from, uh, just to shut my mouth and listen to what she had to say about my particular situation. And she pretty much told me, ouch, I still remember, like painful truths, like she'd seen it all, you know, what the situation was, how long it was going to take, how much it was going to cost, what I was going to have to do. And, you know, if at the end of that, you still want to go through with it, then I think you sort of know, because, you know, it it's uh and she said famous words it's not um it's not a sprint it's a marathon and you know that's so true right I, I you know you have to pace yourself and she said you don't have to have all the energy you're going to need for the entire process right now all you have to do is go home and gather the stuff together that i tell you you have to get just do one thing at a time and that was just such great advice and she kept me from doing a lot of stupid things for the next four and a half years you know i i, I just uh listening to her was I, I don't know it was just i i think choosing the right lawyer is like more important than like choosing the person to marry especially if you decide to unmarry them <laughs> And, and Karen, I mean, look, I, I am a big believer in a team. Um, you and I haven't worked together because you're in California. Right. Okay. Um, so we haven't worked together, but, um, but I do work with a whole team of people. So how do you work as a team with, with attorneys? How does the CDFA work as a team with, with attorneys on a divorce? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I'm happy to answer it. So in, in my practice, and I've been in practice for over 13 years now, um, what I've done is I align myself in terms of my professional connections. So I'm aligning with mediators, uh, Lisa, attorneys who are acting as mediators. Um, I have relationships with, with litigators. Um, for the collaborative practice situation, I think we may have brought this up last year. I'm a financial neutral with a collaborative practice group. So my alliances over the years have been built with my client in mind in terms of what they need the most to get the best result, right? So over these years, I've built those connections to the point where I identify it now, to your point, Lisa. If a client comes to me for that divorce financial analysis, I'm listening to those facts, just like you listen to Don. I'm like, ooh, you need X, because these are some issues coming up right now. You need X, or you need Y. And that's how I do it, and that's how I do it. And Gary could probably speak to this as well. Your clients really depend on you for these referrals. And I'm very, very careful about who I'm referring to and why, um, because they're looking to me right now, right, as a part of this solution package. So I don't want to be uh, the person, I don't want to be that person that referred somebody that was not competent and ready to go. So I build the teams as I go, uh, Lisa, but I, I've built those professional relationships over the years. 
and I know how best to try to service my that's clients when they come to me. So that's how yeah, I do that's it. That's an interesting point because I think when I, when I think about Lisa and I think about even what, what I do, integrity is such an important aspect because when you're standing there in front of the judge or you're on the witness stand or you're involved in these type of transactions, if you don't do the right thing, they're not going to believe you. And if they don't believe you, your client's going to be harmed. Mm -hmm. And it's so important. And when I do what I do, I always give the other side credit. Sorry, so I'm, I'm going to say it. And you might be sitting there saying, Gary, you know what? How could you do that? You have to give the other side the credit that they're due. Because if you don't, it's going to come back and bite you. You're going to get much more in return by showing the integrity that you're giving them the credit they're entitled to so that you can get what you're entitled to on the other side. Yeah, I, 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 go ahead, oh, Dawn, sorry, go I ahead. Say, I, I always forget to mention, and I really should not, that the child advocate in our case was incredible. And he was such an important part. I mean, of the, he, he was, I, I just, I can't think of him without like choking up. He was, he was also, and we, we did use a forensic accountant also, you know, I mean, it is true that it, it takes, it takes a village, no, no question. I just, but I just want to, I just want to say that having a good child advocate is, is, is just, uh, it's so and, important. And when you say child advocate, you mean the attorney for the child, correct, John? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because we, what we do in, and I don't know what it is in California, but in New York, we call them attorneys for children and they advocate for what the children wants to do. And um, I will say that people are often very, and it's good you brought this up because people are often very frightened at the idea that their children are going to have an attorney and that their children are going to meet with an attorney, et cetera. But I will also say that um, it, it really does um, I think it, it has a positive effect on so many children um, because they are having their voices heard through through the process and they know that things are going on and they know their parents voices are being heard, but they need to know that their voices are sometimes being heard as well. And that's such an important point that you raise, John. It really is. Um, Gary, you know, you and I um, just did depositions this week actually together. And um, I, I kind of I want to go back to what a deposition is, because I think that um, so so a deposition, everybody gathers in the room, everybody who is everybody. It's not the court. It is the parties, meaning the husband and the wife or the husband and husband or wife and wife. And they gather in in the room with a reporter who is taking down everything that's said and a lawyer who is asking the questions of the other spouse. And, and the other spouse has their lawyer. So there's usually um, at least like six people in the room. And then um, you are having this under oath testimony, essentially, so that if there's a trial later, you have already your answers to many of the questions. But even if there's not a trial, this is a place to understand what the assets are, what the liabilities are, what the expenses are, et cetera. And very often, I work with a forensic accountant. Now, Gary, tell us how that works. How do you work with the attorneys to do these depositions and why are they important to do? Sure. So, well, the first thing we do is as we look through the financial information, um, we create questions that the attorneys are going to ask during the deposition. Um, but let best laid plans of mice, men, and women, uh, directions often change. And as you go through the deposition, Sometimes um, the individual who's sharing the information will start to talk and one thing will lead to another and we, we will sit there next to Lisa or one of her partners or one of her team members and pass notes back and forth. And if the person will say, well, yeah, I had that boat, but I sold it. Uh, but, you know, but we looked on the cash flows and we didn't see any of the revenue coming in from the sale of the boat. What did you do with the sale of the boat? Et cetera, et cetera. So one thing leads to another and you start to pull, as I said before, that thread. And the deposition for all intents and purposes is really a fact finding mission. What it is, it gives you an opportunity to hear from the horse's mouth uh, information that you can utilize to either gather other information or ask the similar question at trial or before the trier of fact and see if the answer changes. 
because oftentimes during a deposition, um, the people will say what's on their mind because it's they don't know what's coming up. They don't know the question that's being asked. They're going to answer it, and they that someone's usual instinct is to answer the the question, um, you know, so quickly because they they want to get out of there. Uh, and Lisa and I have been in various depositions that have gone on for hours upon hours upon hours, and we've even had the witness threaten to us that they're not going to stay. Um, and we even had that with another professional. That CPA for the other for the individual, it was a husband and wife. He was the CPA for the business. Was was held? I think he was held in contempt of court by the judge. Yes, I forgot about that. Yes. Oh yes. yes. He had he had an appointment that he babysat his daughter's children. And he, he come hell or high water, uh, excuse my French, he was not going to miss his day with his grandchild, even though he was ordered by the court to appear as an expert. Uh, that particular CPA, the, the, the husband should get his money back based upon the, uh, the books and records that that CPA kept. Uh, but notwithstanding that, um, that CPA did provide a wealth of information because he had a, he had a duty to the court to, uh, to be truthful. So to put it in context a bit, um, we take what are called party depositions, so husbands and wives and spouses, and then we also take non-party depositions. So many times we will need um, a CFO of a company or a partner or right. an accountant, to your point, Gary, where um, they have done the books and the records and you know we get these, I, I don't know, I don't remember, and then we have to go to the next step. One question that comes up a lot, and Gary, I am going to direct this to you again because it's such an important sure. question. So I have lots of people who come to me and they say, my husband has um, hidden all the assets. How are you going to ever find them? And I say, that's what you need a forensic accountant for. Okay. Right. And they say, it's going to be impossible. He's been working on this forever. And, and, and how are you going to find them? So can you kind of give us some information about that? What happens at that point? Do is you you look you look at you look at the again the life it's it's the lifestyle it's the net worth statement you look to the financial institutions that he does work with to look at the personal financial statements you you interview the people in the office that he works for the CFOs the bookkeepers um, the secretaries the other individuals that they work with on a daily basis because they really know where for all intent and purpose the bodies are buried. Uh, and they probably know more than the spouse um, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, we're involved in a number of transactions where, um, where, and, and Lisa, going back to that one where the CFO was allegedly a partner in the business, um, and then you know, but it turns out the he's saying he was only a partner on paper. So now we got to get the the tax returns for the CFO as well as the entities that this individual owns. Um, and you got to look to family members too, because oftentimes when we're involved in these types of transactions, the family members are fueling um, the operations or the lifestyle of the individuals during the marriage. So it, 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 it's very, very difficult. And as I said before, there are a number of ways to do it. If you, don't, if you can't get it from the income side, because it's a cash business, you look to the expense side. And we've subpoenaed delivery records from... from um, from uh, gas suppliers, we've de su subpoenaed delivery records from box manufacturers because they're the ones that uh, that the product is put in when they sell them to third parties. We 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 we've we've gotten records from credit card companies uh, that show all the transactions that are go on. So you know, it what it is is essentially, as I said before, it's a roadmap. And what you've got to do if you if you go down one road and it doesn't lead somewhere. You try and pick up enough information that you can utilize it as you head down another road. And it's a journey. It's going to take time. Don't think that it's going to be done in a short amount of time. Are there are there uh, matters that get settled quickly? Sure. No doubt about it. But for all intents and purposes, if, if, if things are being hidden, it's going to be a much longer uh, road to go down. And, and the question, I guess, John, um, yours took a long time. I mean, and so I, I always say that the hardest part is the stamina portion of it, having the stamina and the staying power. And what are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, we were talking about the, the motions and I, you know, there were lulls in between. 
And, you know, I think that for me, I'd like, I, you have to take advantage of those, you know, you're not thinking about your divorce, like a hundred percent of the time. I think you have to, you know, uh, I, for instance, I mean, I wrote a book during my like separate, you know, the whole separation period. I, and I also think that I, I felt like I sort of had a duty to my child to try to keep things as normal as possible. And so, you know, you want to keep your life, you know, you do the work because divorce is work. I mean, it was like having a second job. I mean, uh, so you do the work and then you let it go and you trust your lawyer. And then when you have more work to do when the motion is, you know, there's a counter motion, you deal with the, I mean, I just felt like it was cyclical. So uh, that's sort of how I kept my sanity. You know, you think, oh my God, you went through a divorce for four and a half years. It didn't feel like four and a half years straight. So um it's like, it's like a marathon that you run in stages. You run and then you rest and then you run some more. <laughs> that's, that, that's, and, that, and, that, and that's how the information comes too. It comes in waves because some, oftentimes you, you get it, you digest it. And then it might be, it might be two to three months before you get something else. Yeah. And, it, and, and you know, it's ebbs and flows. It's ebbs and flows. So there's some questions. So I'm going to do um, two things. I'm going to ask you each for um, two takeaways each of, from each of you as to what people should know about this process. And then I'm going to go through the questions. So um, I'll start with Dawn. What are your two takeaways? Um, well, I, I think I gave a lot of the sort of more important things. I think, um, you know, as I said, I think choosing the right lawyer uh, and, and also, you know, by extension team, um, I, I did not have a certified divorce financial analyst. I would probably use one now in addition. Um, and we did have a forensic accountant. I really wish we had found something we didn't. <laughs> um, and as I said, that the child, the child advocate, that, you know, that was another part of the, of the team. Um, so and anyway, the fact that uh, Karen used a great term, she says, and when people have divorce remorse, um, I, you know, the reason I don't have divorce remorse is because I had such a great, great team of people. So um, do, do the research. Absolutely. Um, that's not something you will regret. Um, and also make sure that you can afford whoever you choose and that they're honest with you about how long this is going to take, because, you know, it's going to take longer than you think. It's going to cost more than you think. So, uh, you know. And then the other thing is, you know, this was the hardest thing I ever did. And I have done some really hard things. I come from a crazy family. I've had a lot of trauma, but it was the best thing I ever did. I mean, I really, I still thank God every morning that I am not married to my ex-husband. I'm, you know, I needed to get out of there. Um, and I have a great life now. You know, I have a great job. I actually can support myself. I and saving for retirement, although I took a hit like everybody else in the last year, all the all the more reason to have a good job. I finally found a great guy. We've been going out for five years. It took me a long time to figure out how to choose the right guy, but hey, better late than never. So, you know, you do get through it, you know, and so if you're thinking about it and you really are serious about it, you should actually do it. And Karen, what are your two takeaways? You know, three is my number for everything, so I'm, I'm always a renegade, so um, I'm going to do three really quickly in the interest of time. Uh, the first one is that divorce is difficult. Divorce finances don't need to be. And having the right governance and the right team on what happens is what's important. Someone says certified financial, what? Certified divorce financial analyst, right, is the other person Don was referring to, and that's the work that I do and all my professionals do in that space. Um, the second thing that I'm, that I'm, that I'm going to say is the battle cry is no divorce remorse, right? Working with the right professionals to get the result that's right for your family and crafted for your family is, is very, very key. And the second one is take good care of you. Third one is take good care of yourself. Whether that's through therapy, whether that's coaching, I don't care what you need to do. Because my father said something that sounded kind of cryptic, but I didn't get it until I was older. Um, you get in that casket by yourself. Death is not a party. So you can't let this process drive you to a place of no return. You cannot. So uh, the third thing is probably the most important thing is take good care of yourself. Thank you, Lisa. I agree with that. And Gary, tell us what your three takeaways are. Well, or two takeaways. <laughs> <laughs> They've expanded, thanks to Karen. 
<laughs> so so I'm, I'm going to say what I said earlier, that knowledge is power. As you go through this, make, make sure that you, you keep track of what you're doing and always work with a team that believes in you. Uh, I'm working now with an individual who has an attorney who, for whatever reason, is just going through the motions. Uh, and that attorney, for whatever reason, and I don't know why, because we're continuing to find additional documentation information, that this particular attorney that I'm working with, um, I've never worked with before, and i got to tell you, I probably would never work with them again, but I inherited this individual through this client. Um, and I, for some reason, I believe that this attorney lost faith or, or, or belief in the individual. Uh, and I can't tell you why. So it's so important to have a team that believes in you and a team that works well succinctly together. Um, you know, it's so important. So to have somebody that knows what you need and need, need, you know, and having done this before that that's so, so important. Can, can I give a third one since you since can, <laughs> I have. Go, go for it. Oh, oh, well, I just wanted to say that I the thing I'm most proud of is is having insulated my child during this process and also having fostered a relationship with his father. It was not easy. Um, and so looking back, that's just I, I, I think that's just really important to mention. So I, I'm going to give it a couple of takeaways. Um, divorce remorse, I think, is is um, very key. Because I think that people who don't um, do the due diligence and who actually don't figure out what there really is, and you may not know everything at the end, okay? But if you don't actually go through the process and, and make the attempt to figure it out, you may end up years later having that divorce remorse and you can't fix it later. So that that's number one. And that's why it's so important to have the team, to have the CDFA, to have the forensic accountant, to have the attorney for the child, if it's appropriate, to have all of those pieces in, in place, because there's no going back. This is like your shot to do it now. And then the other, I, I would say, is having the stamina. And, and the stamina really is hard. Sometimes it's hard to go through the process and it is a lengthy process. But again, it goes back to it. it, it is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And if you don't go through the process, you don't go back again. And you, you you could have all the divorce remorse you want, but you're not going to actually be able to fix the problem. You've given up the assets at that point. You've given up the support that you could get. You you have walked away from it. There's no going back because There's it's no, final. No more bites at the apple. That's right. There's no more bites at that apple. That's exactly right. So I, I think that that's a very key um, key thing. I'm going to actually um, go through some questions um, by people. So um, this person actually has said, we have properties um, and businesses that I know, but they're titled under um, my husband's name. I don't know how much rights I have on these assets. One of the houses we are currently living in, he bought it before our marriage, through a joint partnership with his brother and his father um, before our marriage. However, we paid off the mortgage during the marriage. What happens? Do I need to, to do anything? So I, I'm going to answer that to some degree. Um, if he bought it before the marriage, it may be separate property. Um, if he paid the mortgage off during the marriage, however, there may be a component of marital property to it. And there may be a credit, not only for the mortgage pay down, the amortization of the mortgage, okay? That's what it's called when you actually are reducing the balance of the mortgage, okay, is the amortization. And that balance reduction, if it was reduced by, a mar by marital monies, earnings during marriage, that may be something you're entitled to. You also could be entitled to appreciation if there was active appreciation, meaning you helped to do it in some way or marital monies were used for renovations or um, you know extensions to the house, et cetera. So that's really important. The other part, parts that you may be able to get credits for are taxes paid, real estate taxes paid, um, insurance paid. That's what the case law in New York says. It may be different depending upon where you're located in the country country. And it is in New York state, we have equitable distribution, which means it's equitable, fair, supposedly, but not necessarily equal. Um, in California, it's community property, right, Karen? So that's right. That's right. That's right. So that but it's not always equal. And that's what I tell people. 50-50 is not always the best split if you're in a CP state and there's nine of them uh, in the United States. So, but yes, it is 50. It is, it is 50-50. 
So it's going to depend. And the fact that it's titled in somebody's name doesn't necessarily mean anything. OK, um, you know, assets are transferred all the time. They shouldn't be. Um, sometimes we were able to recover them if there was no consideration. Um, Gary, right. We, we've gone after those assets that are transferred and, and, and tried to pull them back into the marital pot. Um, so that's that's a question for that. Um, another question, Gary. Um, what is the difference between a neutral and a um, and and being a neutral forensic or being not a neutral forensic? Essentially, a neutral forensic works for the court for all intents and purposes, working together for both spouses concurrently. And it's important when you're a neutral uh, that you don't have any ex parte communication. And what I mean by that is both attorneys have to be written to, both attorneys have to be on the calls, both the attorneys are entitled to all the information that you're entitled to as you go through the process. Whereas, and you're really not an advocate for either one. What you're doing is you're doing an, you're doing an uh, evaluation or a lifestyle analysis um, on behalf of both of the parties. And when we go through the lifestyle analysis or we do valuations, we always interview individuals uh, and, and when you're a neutral, typically what you'll do is you'll, in, you'll interview both parties. Um, when you're an advocate for one, you might be interviewing both parties, but oftentimes you take what the other party is saying with a grain of salt because you're, you're representing uh, one individual, not both parties as a neutral. So here's another question. Um, should I be concerned about my ex um, pulling, or my, I guess my spouse, pulling money out of his retirement accounts to keep the money moving, or will this be exposed during the discovery period? So, Gary, I'll let you answer that. Hopefully, it will be. Uh, yeah, anyone worth their salt will ask for all the assets, and, and and that item should be one of those items on that net worth statement. But again, you got to look at the net worth statement to see what it is at one particular point in time, pre or post dissipation of the assets. And um, another question that came up is, what if you haven't worked for 20 years? How do they figure out your income? How can they equate that to earning part to the earning partner's income? So um, I'm going to answer this um, just because we do this all the time. So um, there are vocational analysts, um, which Karen had referred to, um, who will analyze in um, somebody's educational background and their employment background and the and the job market at the time and with all of those facts and we may have one of those people on on the last part of the series that we do by the way um but so stay tuned for the rest of this series coming up um but um essentially that person will come up with fig a, a, a figure of um a range of what somebody can earn and just because somebody says that they're not earning or they close their business or they're um they're no longer employable doesn't mean that that's so this person, you know, we have a client who um, whose spouse, they just came up with $800,000 for a non-working spouse, okay? It happens all the time, okay? Is, you know, the income is imputed is, is the answer. So it doesn't, the court is not required to use somebody's income that they then have during the divorce. The, the court can look further than that, but your lawyer has to make sure that the court looks at it and and your team has to, has to do that. Um, let me just see if there's anything else that um, if somebody asked Gary, how much is a lifestyle analysis? Can you answer that? It really depends upon the size of the, mm -hmm. the lifestyle, to be honest with you. I mean, we've done them uh, very quickly. Other, others take months to do because of the volume of the transaction. So it's not it's not a um, it's not an exact science. Uh, it depends upon the, the, the marital estate and how many transactions are flowing through. And somebody here has um, an interesting question. I'm well down the mediation path and we're on good terms, but I've made little financial progress. His business dealings are, quote, creative. Thus, we have decided to go outside, quote, outside the box with our solution. We will be crafting it, but need a professional vet with, um, for fairness, lost growth opportunities. What type of person should that be? It's a matter of creative real estate dealings. A typical financial neutral has not been the answer. Most properties are running at, quote, a loss. Um, any ideas there um, from Gary or Karen? Yeah, um, I would say that you'd either want to work with a forensic like Gary or you want to work with someone like me who's a certified divorce financial analyst. 
Uh, we will be taking that and, and I know in my practice, I can run uh, different projections, different scenarios. We can take things out, put things in um, and figure out what is the right way to get it done, particularly when you're dealing with something uh, that Lisa described in this particular fact pattern that doesn't really fit the norm. You know, we need to come through this, we need to figure it out, but we need to basically have a verifiable base to do it from. So we're not just pulling numbers out of the air. There's a verifiable base to do it from, but you need to creatively work through that verifiable base, if that makes sense. So that is what I would uh, advise uh, the individual to look for. And Gary? Something that we didn't talk about that it, that's an important aspect of the lifestyle and as well as valuation, it's called normalization. And what happens is when you do, when you do a value of business, there's oftentimes either related party transactions or there are things that are in the business that are not similar to other businesses that would operate uh, the way this individual's operating them. So for example, they might own the real estate where the business is being operated at. And what they're doing is they're giving a favorable rent uh, uh, expense uh, to the business because it's going from one pocket to the other and something called depreciation that will shelter that income. Well, if we normalize and put that rent at market rents, the value of the building, rather than being $2 million, might be $5 million. So normalization is an important aspect of any True. business. Uh, and you've got to look at um, not only the related party transactions, but you've got to look at the compensation of the officers. Uh, they might be getting out perks. I have one, one business that we added back uh, I believe it was a half a million dollars worth of perks to the individual's business. He had, a, he had an apartment in Manhattan. He had, he had a, uh, a, an apartment that he put his paramour up in. He had uh, two cars on the business. He, 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 each, each of the meals that he went to five nights a week was charged to the business, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important when you're doing evaluation and there are losses in the business you got to look and see really why are their losses? Are their losses because they're non-cash items or are their losses because they're draining the business that have to get normalized and added back? So the value of that business, rather being X, could be X times two or three times. That's true. And to answer to back up Lisa and also Don, uh, when you're looking at places, there are places to go to look for these professionals that you can look for your attorney to really guide you for CDFAs. You can always look at the Institute of Divorce Financial Analysts website. Uh, I'm on the board of advisors for my, that's my certifying organization. I'm on the board of advisors for it currently. Um, and so you can always seek a CDFA there. And of course, professionals such as Gary are well known to the attorney community and also uh, have their professional um, uh, places as well. If you're looking to kind of build those teams and try to do the research that Don was referring to earlier. Right. I'm going to add one thing because it was mentioned earlier, um, subpoenas, and I, I just want to address subpoenas because um, they go back to lifestyle analysis valuation. So lots of times we get discovery and then we do the depositions. And then during the depositions, we hear something that is somebody's put in for a loan application or they had to put in a financial statement. Those are my favorite words, financial statements. Um, because to Gary's point earlier, most people like to put in very positive financial statements to the banks and um, or when they're leasing a car or, or there's a zillion different reasons they do it. And I cannot tell you how many cases we have um, actually prevailed on because of those financial statements. They may, for example, and, and Gary knows this, um, they may have actually said, well, I borrowed money from this person or that person during the marriage. No promissory notes, no nothing. And lo and behold, they put in a financial statement that doesn't have any loans. No loans whatsoever. No liabilities whatsoever. Um, or their financial statement is, you know, 20, you know, 20,000 or 20 million more. So you just you you if you are in an action those subpoenas are actually so important and um and actually that's how we closed the loop on something actually just this week in one of our cases gary was a subpoena that came in and your your people asked about it so um that that's it for tonight everyone i really really thank the panel um we will judy are you on did we lose judy Judy's there. um now I am here. Okay, so maybe you could announce what the next two um, sessions, next two um, dates are going to be for everybody. 
Absolutely. So continuing in our Get Divorce Savvy series, and Lisa will continue to be our moderator for our next two is Thursday, February 2nd at 6 p.m. Eastern time, and then also February 9th at 6 p.m. So sign up. We will follow up with an email to everyone who is registered, and you make sure that you pre-register for the next two panels that are coming up. And I think Stacy Francis will also be on for those two as a moderator as well. Um, and um, Gary, I, I think you're coming back for one, perhaps. Um, maybe the last, I think the last one. We have some very interesting people coming up. Um, we're going to be talking actually to um, about a program called Our Family Wizard, which many of you are yeah. familiar with. And if you're not, um, you need to be. I believe that's next week, part of next week's program. And they will be teaching you some very interesting tricks that Our Family Wizard has um, right. for custody, for um, child support issues, all of these different things. So don't miss that one. Um, and then we, again, go back to um, dealing with what you do after the divorce and, and how you run your finances, et cetera. So there's lots of great information coming up. Good stuff. Don't miss we it. We look forward to all of you coming back. All right. Yes, thank you, everyone, for joining. It was a great evening. Good thank evening, you. everyone. Thank you for Thank you, and great questions. Thank Thanks. you. Good luck, Good night. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Dawn. Thank you, yeah. Karen. Good luck, everybody. Thanks, Good night now.